I'm going to read an old Indian tale that, as the video title implies, uh, has dying as its central theme. I am just about ready to get my book on said theme out. That'll be Death and Global Folktales. Been a tremendous amount of work. Very challenging, sad, and rewarding all at the same time. And here is not one of the stories in it, but the kind of story that is in it. Long ago there lived in Rajagriha a king named Malasina, and he had a daughter named Mayavati, of matchless beauty. One day a young man of the fisher caste, named Suprahara, who was in full bloom of youth and good looks, saw her as she was amusing herself in a spring garden. The moment he saw her he was overpowered by love, for destiny never considers whether a union is possible or impossible. So he went home, and abandoning his occupation of catching fish, he took to his bed and refused to eat, thinking only on the princess. And when persistently questioned, he told his wish to his mother, and she said it to her son, My son, abandon your despondency and take food. I will certainly compass this your end for you by my ingenuity. When she said this to him, he was consoled and cherished hopes and took food. And his mother went to the palace of the princess with fish from the lake. There that fisherwife was announced by the maids and went in on the pretext of paying her respects, and gave the princess that present of fish. And in this way she came regularly, day after day, and made the princess a present, and so gained her good will, and made her desirous of speaking. And the pleased princess said to the fisherwife, Tell me what you wish me to do, I will do it, though it be ever so difficult. Then the fisherwife begged that her boldness might be pardoned, and said in secret to the princess, Royal lady, my son has seen you in a garden, and is tortured by the thought that he cannot be near you, and I can only manage to prevent his committing suicide by holding out hopes to him. So, if you feel any pity for me, restore my son to life by touching him. When the princess was thus entreated by the fisherwife, hesitating between shame and a desire to oblige, after reflection she said to her, Bring your son to my palace secretly at night. When the fisherwife heard this, she went in high spirits to her son. And when night came, she deliberately adorned her son as well as she could, and brought him to the private apartments of the princess. There the princess took Suprahara, who had pined for her so long, by the hand, and affectionately welcomed him, and made him lie down on a sofa, and comforted him whose limbs were withered by the fire of separation, by shampooing him with her hand, the touch of which was cool as sandalwood. And the fisher boy was thereby, as it were, bedewed with nectar, and thinking that after long waiting he had attained his desire, he took his rest, and was suddenly seized by sleep. And when he was asleep, the princess escaped, and slept in another room, having thus pleased the fisher boy, and having avoided being disgraced through him. Then that son of the fisher folk woke up, owing to the cessation of the touch of her hand, and not seeing his beloved, who had thus come within his grasp, and again vanished like a pot of treasure in the case of a very poor man, who was despondent for its loss, he was reft of all hope, and his breath at once left his body. When the princess found that out, she came there, and blamed herself, and made up her mind to ascend the funeral pyre with him next morning. Then her father, King Malayasena, heard of it, and came there, and finding that she could not be turned from her resolve, he rinsed his mouth, and spake this speech. If I am really devoted to the three-eyed god of gods, tell me, ye guardians of the world, what it is my duty to do. When the king said this, a heavenly voice answered him, Thy daughter was in a former life the wife of this son of the fisher folk. For long ago there lived in a village called Nagasthala a virtuous Brahmin of the name of Baladhara. When his father had gone to heaven, he was robbed of his wealth by his relations, and being disgusted with the world, he went with his wife to the bank of the Ganges. While he was remaining there without food, in order to abandon the body, he saw some fishermen eating fish, and his hunger made him long for it in his heart. So he died with his mind polluted by that desire, but his wife kept her aspirations pure, and continuing firm in penance, followed him in death. That very Brahmin, owing to that pollution of his desires, has been born in the fisher caste, but his wife, who remained firm in her asceticism, has been born as thy daughter, O king. So let this blameless daughter of thine, by the gift of half her life, raise up this dead youth, who was her husband in a former life. For, owing to the might of her asceticism, this youth, who was thus purified by the splendor of that holy bathing place, shall become thy son-in-law and a king. When the king had been thus addressed by the divine voice, he gave his daughter in marriage to that youth, Suprahara, who recovered his life by the gift of half hers, 
and Superhara became a king by means of the land, elephants, horses, and jewels, which his father-in-law gave him, and, having obtained his daughter as a wife, lived the life of a successful man. In this way, a connection in a former birth usually produces affection in embodied beings. Moreover, in illustration of this truth, listen to the following story about a thief. The End that didn't sound like the end it did it. But the thing is, uh, what I'm reading from, a book published in 1884, is a translation of stories in the original Sanskrit, and they kind of really are strung together one in another in another in another. It's a different narrative device than a lot of us are used to. Fans of global folklore mythology know what I'm talking about, so you'll have one collection that's set up that way, and then you'll move on to another, but you're kind of constantly always returning to the narrators, and it's almost easy to forget who's actually telling the story because you get lost in so many stories within stories. And the story that the narrator was about to segue into was called Story of the Merchant's Daughter Who Fell in Love with a Thief. And we're stopping here because I find it interesting how what we just read feeds into this one. And this one appears in my book, Death and Global Folktales. Well, a version of it does, and one with a completely different title, and one that was part of yet another collection of interrelated tales. Regardless, what we just read forms kind of a prequel then, and a background to that story. So I like that. Um, the one I use uh, is the entirety of my chapter 7, in fact that chapter called The Ways of the Revolving Heavens. Oh, there it is, in the PDF. I actually have a PDF. The book almost exists. I just need the proof copy, physical proof copy, to arrive at my door. So anyway, having this story feed into one of the ones in my book, uh, I thought was a neat way to say thank you to Seamus, who very generously supported this project. I know it's taking time, but I think you'll be very pleased with the book when you have it. I'm really, really happy with how it turned out. Back to the story, or really stories, I guess. Um, what's interesting here, of course, is this note about reincarnation. There are so many common threads when it comes to death in folktales from around the world. That is not one of them. For obvious reasons, as belief in that was a part of a particular belief system. That specific cultural background also gives us another notable feature of the story, which is kind of an unfortunate one, is the long-since banished tradition of a woman dying when her husband dies. This comes up more than once during the story, and every instance is, you know, couched in positive terms. In the last instance, the wife gives up half of her life in order to bring her husband back to life. But in reality, this was a form of human sacrifice, of course. And that is part of the history of dying. This existed from the Mediterranean to South America and all kinds of other places. A lot of times this was about appeasing the gods, which is interesting because then there's so many myths where a god is being sacrificed for the good of humanity. If not with that express intent, then the benefit still, or a benefit still manifests. All part of the tapestry formed by different thoughts, stories, and beliefs about death and dying. I hope everyone who heard the story enjoyed it, uh, but especially Seamus, and once again, thank you.